Joe, as I'm listening to Bexy's stories, I don't know about how you're feeling. I'm finally, I'm putting myself in the position of those kids. Like, listen to your stories, Bexy. I'm thinking, how would I have coped with the year of silence or things like that? How are you feeling about this, Joe? I've got so much anger inside me. I've got so much sadness. And I guess there's pity, not pity, but sympathy, empathy, all stirring round, but mainly the anger one mm. is in, and yet none of this happened to me. And I just can't get my head around it all. But I guess that's part of how cults work, that it's it's not logical, it's yeah, not rational. Worldly. It's, but how the, how does someone go from being a rational human being thinking normally to then just being sucked in by some form of cult with a crazy idea. It's just, I can't get my head around it. It's baffling. It's, it's interesting that you say that, though, because I think one of the things I was really hoping for, um, and not to be too dark or maudlin about it, was I think that while my experience is against the backdrop of something really weird, like we can all agree that, the, the themes of what I experienced are universal. Feelings of being betrayed, abandonment, confusion about parents, having to, you know, f trying to find forgiveness, figuring out whether you have or not. And that's something that I think connects us all. You know, whatever your experience is, my backdrop's different, but the actual stuff I went through, we probably have much more similarities than you think. Um, and I, I don't know. Even people who trust a fairy, I don't know anyone who really kind of rolled down a golden road of like wonderful childhood and then just became an adult and there's no issues. And actually people who haven't suffered any trauma at all, that can fuck you up more than anything, you know, because you don't know how to deal with it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're thrown into something that completely floors you. But I think that there are so many things in my story that that connect to kids everywhere and adults everywhere. And I, you know, you talking about your parents now, sometimes... You have to make the choice of what is right for your mental health. Because I think we're told by society that we should just forgive and that we should all play nicely and that we should, of course, you should speak to your parents. Perhaps if your parents aren't a good influence on you, perhaps if your parents make you feel unhappiness or bring up stuff or trigger you, then you don't need to be around your parents. And you can make that choice as an adult, which is brilliant. That's why we have free will. You are allowed to create your own family as an adult. And maybe that is your children. Maybe that's your friends, however you want to do it. But I surround myself with people who are nourishing and encourage me and support me and help me flourish. I couldn't have done any of the things I've done over the last 10 years without the incredible support of my friends who are my family, my brothers and sisters. And when I looked at the effect my parents have on me, it's not good. And they aren't particularly good people. And even if they're good people to other people, how they are with me isn't. So I think that we're all allowed to make that decision and we shouldn't be, you know, ashamed of the fact that, you know, I, I don't believe in this catch-all idea of forgiveness as a blanket statement because I think sometimes that can be quite dangerous to think that we all just have to forgive. Um, that ca doesn't come from a place of bitterness at all. It comes from a place of going, OK, actually, understand that it's complicated and that sometimes forgiveness works in waves. Sometimes one day I'll forgive and the next day you won't and that's all right as well. Joe, where should we go next? We're, we're both quite, I think, interested slash freaked out by how easily people can be manipulated because mm. Bexie we see this even today don't we with the yeah. stuff like the Capitol Hill insurrection or maybe some of the stuff around Brexit or even I don't know if this is really culty some of the stuff you get around big companies about how it's not just I'm working for a company how people buy in totally to the ethos it's more than just a job mm. well if you think about some of the big tech companies mentioning no names Google. Um, <laughs> you think Sorry, were you asking me to Google those companies? Or... <laughs> yes, exactly that. Ah. If you, you know, you go to their kind of compounds, which are in Silicon Valley, and you have somewhere where you do your laundry, you have your food uh, made for you, you have napping pods, aka don't leave. You have these ethos around the company, which like, you know, everyone has the kind of like mantras, etc. that they say, the vernacular. You know, they have little things where like, oh, you put on the, the Google 15 pounds when you join because they've got cheese boards everywhere. And it's like this, there is this kind of, there, there, it's, it, there's a lot of comparisons, I think, between those kind of companies and corporations and 
cults in a way. Because when you join Google, you put on fifteen. Pounds. Yeah, they call it like the Google fifteen pounds because there's because there's just so much food food everywhere. I mean, I got to be honest with you, Google in comparison to the children of God, we had no cheese boards. There was <laughs> nothing like that going on. We didn't have a slide going into a ball pen. You know all that shit that you see in their offices where you're like, oh my god, like does anyone ever use this? But the napping pod, I can get behind. Yeah, it'd be nice, think, wouldn't it? I think. It's because of the word cult that scares people or immediately goes, oh, God, it must be negative because it's called a cult. But the way you've just described Google and other big businesses Mm. and the culture that they create in order for their staff to work efficiently and get the best out of them, is is there anything wrong with that? No, oh, I mean it's just it's just drawing comparisons, isn't it? And you know that's how they get people to stay, and that's how they get people to you know work really hard and follow those hours, is because they are in an environment where they feel like you know it's not about joining a company; it's about finding your people in a way. You know, it's that thing again. So it's a very clever way. Yeah, of twi- it's very twisting very clever. But of course, you know, in comparison, it's you know very harmless in comparison to you know other groups that are out there. But you are right to kind of pull the comparisons of you know capitol hill and things like that where what was capitol hill what we were just discussing with the storming the the trump supporters who stormed the oh capitol yes building in mm. the u.s it's called capitol hill well you know as in that's where it is is it on a hill <laughs> slight rise <laughs> An incline. We should call it think, capital incline. I, think that's <laughs> not... I, just, I just want things to be a little bit more, you know, <laughs> you need it specific. To, yeah, exactly. But the point being that people in the right place at the right time with the right kind of momentum behind them can, you know, galvanise around ideas. Um, and I never say this right. Do, is it QAnon? QAnon, yeah. QAnon. Um, sorry. Look at, look at... Sorry, QAnon. Yeah, because it's it's an acronym, isn't it? Is so, that like... like it's difficult um, to say. Eritrea. Is this a, <laughs> no. Is this independent capital of it's, Ethiopia. It's the massive kind of group of people, and there's a huge amount of them in the UK that have this whole idea around what's happening with governments and conspiracy theories, and it's like rising at a h- exponential rate. Um, you know, they believe that there's kind of like witchcraft and Satanism and all kinds of stuff happening behind the scenes. Look into it. It's, it's, it's wild. It's totally wild. It's not Scientology. It's a more of an online group of conspiracy theorists. But like they did, a, and I might get these figures wrong, but I only researched this a couple of weeks ago. So if it is incorrect, I apologize. But they were saying that there was something in, in the region of like one in four people in the UK that were starting to have leanings towards believing it. And it's like, it's mad. Um, so, you know, it's about the right time, right place, right person to kind of, you know, look at anti-vaxxers and all the stuff that's happening around that. So there are comparisons that you can draw. And that's why whenever people say to me, how did your parents join? It's like, think about the time and the place and think about what they were going through in the Vietnam War and all of the stuff that was happening with the riots and everything, that you know, marches for everything going on at that time. And I can almost imagine being in that time period and thinking to myself, the world can't go on. You know, nuclear war, all the rest of that. You know, everything that was going on politically. So I always, I like to think that the majority of people that joined the Children of God did it because of a good purpose rather than a negative one and it just went horribly wrong. But you can see, yeah, you can draw lots of comparisons to what's happening in, in you know, society now. If we were to try and start a benign cult <laughs> with Joe as our cult leader... Does that mean only nine people can join? Yeah, yeah, we'd yep. be a very small cult. Bexy, how do we do it? <laughs> well, as you say, first of all, you need a charismatic puppet, so tick on that. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm oh, kidding. Cut me, cut, I'm absolutely charismatic. kidding. I, okay, you know, that's nice. Do you know puppet. what? Oh, the, no, this is the unfortunate thing. It's like there aren't really, not unfortunate, but there really weren't that many female cult leaders. So maybe we could be the first, you know, and have instead of, you know, Joe, it could be me. But Perfect. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, why, I struggle. Why, why do you think that is? Um, they, because men are they, pieces of shit. Well, they tended to. They tend to take a more of a Girl Friday role within the group. So, for example, the kind of matriarchal sidekick that, you know, David Berg had um, Mama Maria. Like, there's there's tons of examples of that. The only real female cult leader that most people think of is um, is uh, Osho's. Um, what's her name? She- Sheila from the Osho's. What's Osho's? The Osho's is the... Did you ever see Wild Wild Country? It's on Netflix. It's an amazing series. I absolutely recommend it. When, yeah, it's about people who cathartically dance. It's all kind of meditation. It's very Eastern-based religion. 
and they all wore red and they basically bought a piece of a town in America and created like a commune of like 10,000 people. It was huge. The series is incredible. And this woman, Sheila, who was terrifyingly brilliant and badass and with this devil may care, give a fuck attitude, like, like you watch her in front of the press, the questions that they ask and how she responds, you're like, oh my God, like I almost could have joined this cult. Although saying that, the only cult I think I would have ever joined was the Source family. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. Not the the Source. Source family. The Source family was the reason I, why... I want them to be people that just eat sauces. No, no, no. The <laughs> Source, yeah, but that, I mean, I joined that as well. I love a condiment. <laughs> All about condiments. Um, most things that I have are just carriers for hot sauce. But anyway, that's the whole <laughs> other podcast, I'm sure. The Source family was run by a guy who used to be a millionaire uh, no, used to be an actor, and now he was a millionaire. So most cults have the um, structure of you give us all your money, <laughs> and we'll welcome you in. So you know, sell your possessions and goods, give it to the group, and that's how they survive. This group was completely different. Where this guy was a millionaire, and he funded the entire group. Not only did he fund it, everyone was hot and sexy, wore white, and drove around in white limousines. What? And he started the first. <laughs> vegan restaurant in California, the first one ever during a time when everyone was like ready for this because they were all taking, you know, LSD and ayahuasca and being like, why would we hurt harm, harm animals? So he started this. It was a smash success. And he, the pictures of him, he's wearing like white suits, trilbies, he's got a cane, he's surrounded by these hot women in white. He basically looks like a pimp and he was like a wrestler or a fighter at one point. He said he killed a man with his bare hands. He was a previous, previously was an actor. I mean, this guy is incredible. And like, when I watched the documentary, I was like, you know what, I would have joined that cult. Like, look at the outfits and the fact that he funded the entire thing. So the hierarchy of power completely changes. And he had these big mansions out in like the Hollywood Hills where he just would supply drugs for everybody to get like messed up for days on end. And they were all taking like hallucinogenics and it, it was funded by him. And I'm like, I can get behind that. Cause the only person that's really being exploited in that scenario is probably him. You know what I mean? What was that one called? The Source The one. Source family. Yeah, the Source family. So that's yeah. that, his, the actual description of the Source family is much better than what we Ketchup. wanted it to be. <laughs> People just living off of. Has he got that sauce. one the wrong way round? Where he's really fucked up on one of the fundamental rules, rules about a cult, where he's failed to give it an amazing name. Yeah. But the reality is actually. Oh. Yeah, but he's done it. The source is in the source of life. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. In my head, I'm. Are we? Are we now saying that the, the more examples we get into like that, that not all cults are bad? Yeah, I mean, this is. I mean. Again, cult is a very hyperbolic term and it's one that academics would never use. I use the word cult, which basically describes groups as having something deviant or wrong about them. I use the word cult because I feel like I have a right to. And it's not something that is actually okay to use according to academics because it's, it describes them as deviant. You're meant to say new religious movements. I'm never going to describe... NRM, NRMs. I'm never going to describe the children of God as a new religious movement. They were a cult. They were a cult to me. They were deviant. But a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object, a person or thing that is popular or fashionable among a particular group of or section of society. What? <laughs> I should really read stuff before I read it. You, know? <laughs> you did really well there. Um, but no, they they um. The, the the word, you're not supposed to use it, I however do, but your question of are not our cults all bad, it's like that some of the groups that I joined in my journey, actually I came away from going like, oh, there, there was one, the Ananda community, for example, which was the first group that I joined where they are more kind of like meditative and yogic community and they wear robes and they have like, you know, um, monks, etc. I looked at the way that they were raising their kids and I was like, hang on a second, this looks quite nice. Like, you know, they had this it's school where everything was a bit more a bit more Steiner-esque in the way that they were um, raising their children. They had subjects like uh, self-development in the universe and stuff like that. And I was mm. like, hang on, I want to enroll in this school. So some of the groups that I stayed with actually opened my mind to the idea of that it can be done right. Not necessarily right, but it can be done in a way that isn't harmful for your kids. I just stayed with a group called Rose Creek that used to be really strict and they were you know, Armageddonist and all the rest of it. And then they realised at some point that they just couldn't do that anymore. They were, it was wild. They were in a compound in the middle of the forest in Tennessee. And I'd heard like 
quite negative things about them and came and I was taken in by the kind of like leader of the group. I wouldn't call them a cult because they didn't come across as such. They came across more as a religious community where, you know, they were all living together. And um, the most interesting thing that I found about these guys, they didn't have TV or music or anything to begin with, but somehow at one point the teenagers were going through a rebellion and the teenagers, I don't know how, found out about Michael Flatley, Lord of the Dance. What? <laughs> In a compound, in the in the compound in the forest of Tennessee, and what these kids did, who were all having to wear like modest clothing, like they were meant to be the new Israel, they all practiced the <laughs> river dance in secret because they weren't even allowed to really like hang out with each other. And then one of the big gatherings that they had, like the, this group had gatherings like every week, the teenagers came in. And I saw a video of this and even talking about it now gives me goosebumps because the guy who was the leader of this group said to me, I've got something really amazing to show you and put this bit of VHS footage on. I don't know how they filmed it, whatever. And these teenagers come in proudly. They turn on a tape of the river dance <laughs> and all of a sudden they start dancing around with like this magic syn synchronicity in absolute like powerful like they're still wearing their modest like you know new israel clothes and they're doing the fucking river dance and this is i'm like what like my mind was blown i was like how did michael flatley get into this cult in tennessee <laughs> uh anyway the the guy who was the leader of the group at that point said to me we realized on that night that we were constraining our children and we realised that we needed to change because this was a proud moment for these teenagers of being like, this is us, like this is us. And they did it through, you know, Lord of the Dance, which sounds weird, but it was so powerful. So they changed the way that they were treating their kids and they'd started letting them hang out together. They started letting them wear normal clothes and they essentially just became a community that was intentional community on a farm and was, you know, allowed music, allowed movies, all the rest of that stuff. It kind of, But it was a moment where the kids allowed themselves to be seen. And I think that as somebody who grew up in a cult, that's the thing that we're all, I think, looking for, is that moment that our parents put us first and said, okay, do you know what? He, yes, I get it, I get it. We do believe this, but we want to put you first. And that's what happened in this group. So in answer, this is a very long answer, and I don't know how we got to Michael Flatley, but um, <laughs> but in answer to your question of are, are they all bad, it's like, no, they're not. There are groups out there that are putting their children first and that do know how to raise their kids in ways that are different and interesting and, you know, will be a different perspective from the one that, you know, an average child will have. But as long as it's not this harmful experience, then, you know, it comes from, and if, as long as the intention behind it is good and from the right place, I think that's what, you know, what we should all be striving for. I think it's mental that <laughs> only yesterday we were talking about Michael Flatley. No. Um, because I th I actually thought he owned Aer Lingus. No, you didn't. You thought what he was owned it? Ryanair. Ryanair. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... It was actually Michael O'Leary, and I thought it was Michael O'Flatley. <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah, I used to do the river dance when I was younger. Did you? I just thought he he just went on to be really successful at that. He's branched and then out. bought an airline. Yeah. Oh, from his feet to the skies. <laughs> That's a good Brilliant. cult name as well. <laughs> Maybe he should buy an airline. Maybe we should buy an airline as part of our benign cult of only nine people. Yeah. So far, it's me, Tom... Beck, Bexy, Robbie, are we letting Steve in? <laughs> I think we have to brainwash Steve first. Mm. I don't think Steve wants to come in. Oh. Steve, he's shaking his head at us. He doesn't want to be an artist. Tough, he's in. Um, <laughs> and Michael O'Flatley. Or uh, Michael Flatley, I mean. <laughs> Do you know, he'd make a good cult leader, wouldn't he? He would. He'd yeah. Bamboozle me with his, with his feet. <laughs> I'd be like, oh my god, I can't <laughs> stop looking at his feet. What about other um, celebrity rumored? I say it's rumored, but they've been linked to cults. Oh, give Didn't, give us some. You got any other uh, off the top of your head, Tom? Well, it depends how you define cult, doesn't it? Bex, you might help us out here. Scientology, obviously. Tom Cruise. Terrifying. I Are wouldn't. I wouldn't touch Scientology with someone else's barge pole. Really? No, they, is they Scientology wanna... a cult or is it a religion? Yeah, I would say it's a cult. Absolutely, it's a cult because the intentions behind it. Again, I'm probably going to have Scientologists sifting through my rubbish after saying this on your podcast. But you know, <laughs> I believe the intentions behind it are are not coming from a good place. You know, it is about. If you've read any of the memoirs of anyone who's grown up in the Scientologists, um, which there is a, a good few. Um, 
you know, it, it didn't come from, it doesn't feel like it's coming from a good place. And perhaps for the upper echelons, it absolutely works. Like if you have this network of people who are all powerful and there's loads of money and they're high tech and everything and you're trying to get ahead, like it feels like it works for certain people. But, you know, it doesn't feel like what's coming through on the intention side of things. You look at what they do with the whole fair game thing. If someone speaks out against them and then they're considered to be fair game and that's their you know, their term for it and how they they treat people, the shouting in the face, the filming them, the following them. Like, you can't tell me that that's coming from a place of, like, love and compassion. And that's always been my kind of litmus test as to whether a group is bad or good. It's like, what is the intention behind your belief? Even if you're doing something as innocuous as yoga, if your intention doesn't come from a place of empathy, compassion, connection with humankind, if you're coming from a place of elitism, putting people down or harm... That, to me, I don't care whether you believe in aliens or, you know, yoga. Where is it coming from? Where's the beliefs coming from? What is your intention behind that action? And I don't believe that Scientology comes from a place of, like, compassion for the planet. Is that what you get from from everything you know about them? I don't know what I get from Scientology. Except I, the fear. Well, I don't know. There's a little bit of mystery. I drive past their UK headquarters. Pretty much every day on my way to work yeah. in East Grinstead. Yeah. It's immaculate. Mm. It's it's impressive. I'm like, fuck, I just want to go in there. It looks spotless. All the like arches and the, uh, this massive monument that they've got, the, the tower, it's just like, oh, that looks really... Not cool, but I'd like to go in there. Mm. And apparently you can. Yeah, I met the leader for free. of the Scientologist for, for the UK. And, you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. And um, his name escapes me now because, you know, I haven't had enough coffee. But <laughs> um, he uh, was a very waxy looking man who, you know, when somebody shakes your hand and it's like cold and clammy and feels like they've, oh, like, they've been embalmed. It has, yeah, they've oh. been embalmed. That's a really good way of putting it. Oh. But he had a real waxy quality to him and he spoke in these kind of terms of like, it doesn't matter what route you take up the mountain, the view from the top is but the same. You know, those kind of like, <laughs> where you're like, oh, am, am I, what's happening? Is that, you know? And I remember I went to one of their talks and the woman who was on the stage giving the talk, he was behind me. And I kept looking over and it was like he was directing her from like the seat at the back and it just gave me this, you know, and maybe I was being a bit too, but it gave me this real feeling of like ominous kind of ness to it. Um, and uh, yeah, he was like him and another cult leader that I met in Tucson had a very similar kind of handshake. I <laughs> know that's really weird to kind of... Culty handshake. Culty handshake. Well, I, I can't, don't know how to describe this, but let me... I'm, I'm allowed to shake your hand in a pandemic. What's, it okay. was like that. Oh, like a claw what is that? Wrapping around. But imagine if I had been embalmed and, oh. and then I was like giving you kind of a lobster claw kind of uh, wrap around. It's, it's, it doesn't feel nice, does it? No. Do you feel violated? But you pass bit. it on to you, Joan. It's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like this. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it's not nice, is it? But oh. Oh, that's <laughs> just do like the wet f f fish. Like, uh. If you lick your hand first, you'll oh, get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is a number one way to be a super spreader. Yeah. Don't do this. But this second guy um, who gave me that t the same handshake, which immediately pulled me back into this head of Scientology moment, he was the guy from um, called Gabriel of Urantria, who, I mean, again, this is probably a legal issue to say this, but he was the guy who was well known for thinking that he could heal you with his penis. Which, right, that if, one. again, yeah. yeah, if I had a nickel for that, like, honestly, um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that I think surprises no one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ludicrous. <laughs> what about other, oh, I'm just reading here, Joaquin Phoenix. He was born in the same group that I was. Yeah, so he... River Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix were born in the same group as I was. So was Rosie McGowan. Right. Um, who wrote her, her own book, um, kind of whistleblowing on the children of God, called Brave. Um, Laura Marling recently said that she nearly was in a point in her life when she was living in Los Angeles and doing like lots of different types of transcendental meditation and smoking too much pot. She said that she nearly joined a cult, you know, because I think that, as I said, there's kind of like stages, isn't there? I'm trying to think of who else. Obviously, you've got your you've got your Tom Cruises. Um, and uh, I never say it right because as a dyslexic, anything that's a kind of an acronym is like Nexium. Is that the the way that you say it? The one where they they had the girl from Smallville who has just been, she's been put behind bars, hasn't she? Yeah. She's been put in jail for her part. And this is the thing that I think you can actually get people for. You know, a lot of times it's mind control. You find it, it's difficult to 
to put somebody behind bars for doing something like mind control is really hard to define. But the reason they could get the people behind Nexium is because they physically branded people. So there's a physical mark yeah. and there's a physical thing that they can be like, that is grievously body, grievous bodily harm. Easy for me to say. And so that, you know, that it's interesting because like, I would imagine that the psychological scars that someone can get from a cult are way worse than having a brand, a branding, you know, you know, lot broad strokes but but yeah but it's interesting that from a legal standpoint you have to have something physical Winona Ryder what cult did she join her this family, is news to me her family lived in a commune in northern California with six other families she acknowledges that it was unintentional an intentional community that it was an unconventional and might evoke a fucking shithole <laughs> 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 that was the name of the community <laughs> Oh, it wow. hasn't got a name. Don't worry about that one. So it was kind of like more of a granola upbringing. It sounds quite... A, what, is it they just ate granola? Well, you know how they describe, like, Californians. It's like, oh, yeah, I had a bit of oh, a granola no. upbringing, you know. Michelle Pfeiffer. What, what? Oh, don't. Don't ruin my visions of <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer. She became involved with breatharianism. Breatharianism. Oh, is that when they stop eating and they just survive on air? Yeah. Bre breatharianism. Breath if you can do it, I mean, power to you, because I want to eat every five minutes. I'm not sure that breath existing on the air is... It sounds like you're saying a breathy Iranian. Breath Iranianism. Breath Iranianism. Is it breatharianism? It is breatharianism, For fuck's yeah. sake, why did I just... <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird one. You, They just live on air. Mm. What? Yeah. You can't live on air. I know, it's weird, isn't it? You can't live and on even air. even if you could, would you want to? No, I want a cheeseburger. I really would love one. <laughs> I don't want an air cheeseburger. I don't want an air that burger. Shit. An air burger sounds horrendous. <laughs> what are, if people aren't sure if a group or a movement they're joining, Bexy, is a bit culty, is there a checklist? I mean, Compound I can, seems to be... Compound is a good one. I can give you what my personal opinion on this would be, and I, I'm spitballing, so this might go wrong. If they tell you to stop hanging out with your friends, if they tell you that you shouldn't have any connection with your family, those are red, massive red flags. If they tell you that they, you should start giving them your money, that's a massive red flag. Flag. I think the way that I would always describe it is like, you know when somebody's in an, in an abusive relationship and how they start to control a person is by cutting off all their connection with the outside world, stop dressing how you dress, controlling them. If there's any form of control within it, that's when you need to start asking big questions, for sure. Um, if they're telling you, you know, like, it's the contact with friends and family, I think, which is a massive one. I know, like, my grandparents went through a, a real bereavement over the loss of their daughter. That was huge for them. You know, and cutting people off from all of the things and influences that they've had their entire life is a really good way of controlling them. You know, and as I say, the, the abusive relationship one, I think, is a, is quite a good analogy for it or metaphor, whichever one it is. Um, but, yeah, if they want your money, if they want you to stop, like, I remember I had a therapy session with a woman once and she said to me, when you're under my care, I want you to stop reading other books and stop listening to other people's advice on your mental health. And I was like... Get to fuck. <laughs> because I'm sorry, the minute someone sorry, starts... Sorry. Um, <laughs> if someone starts I, no, to censor no, you... I need to pick up on that <laughs> sentence. Get to fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get to fuck. Get to fuck. Get to fuck. Mm, I think it might be Scottish. Get to fuck. <laughs> Get to fuck. Yeah, there you go. That was really nice. Nicely done. Okay. Executed well. Um, but yeah, and that and that was my kind of like first moment of being with her. I was like, if you try to censor what uh, what people are intaking so that you have a channel into their brains, that's when you should say absolutely not. We should none of us should be censored. What what about free will? We shouldn't be like you know. It's not, it's not like you're going on a diet and we have to like cut things out. It's like we're human beings. Read and consume what you want. So yeah. Do some cults start off with better aims and then they gradually turn dark? Absolutely. Like I'm thinking about Jim Jones, who's one of the most famous cult leaders. Yeah. And the strange thing I found out about Jim Jones, Joe, was that he started off doing loads of civil rights activism and he was getting a lot of incredible things done at a very difficult time had a lot of supporters and then there seemed to be this strange turning point Bexy where it just went very 
very wrong. Yeah, I think that you can, and this is what I was saying about my own investigation into David Bowe, because I wanted to find out if that was the case, because that seems to be quite a normal thing to have happened, as far as nothing normal about Jim Jones. But as far as the trajectory of money, power, sex corrupting, it seems to be quite a... a it's, it's a common happening between with with cult leaders you know the ananda group for example that i told you about where i was like this is actually a really wonderful group what i took out of that story was the fact that their original leader swami kriyananda actually got done on a case of sexual abuse by eight women who um were kind of sexually assaulted by him within the group because he's in a position of power and he assault he you know there was no that what they said in the court cases, it's no, there's no such thing as a form of consent if somebody's power dynamic is that skewed, which I think is interesting as a, as an, a, a, an interesting look at consent anyway, whether it's Hollywood or politics or whatever. If, if the power dynamics are that skewed, then consent becomes a much more complicated thing. Anyway, this guy started out as doing something really wonderful, really good, and then at some point he got twisted, believed his own hype. We see this all the time, even with things like celebrities where people go off the, completely off the rails because... As human beings, I think it's really tough for our wonderful brains to have people tell us that we are incredible all the time and that we are amazing. And, you know, you see it happening with, you know, I don't want to say white shaman and just say just white people, but I've seen shamans from the Western world become corrupt very quickly because as soon as you start believing your own hype is when you let your ego take over. If your ego takes over from the idea of spirituality or compassion or good is when you start to get really fucked up. So, yeah, that I think the Jim Jones is a really good example of it, but I think we can find many more of cult leaders who probably started out with a good purpose and and then you desensitize yourself to the outside world you believe your own hype you believe when people tell you that you are a prophet or when you tell them and then it can go like you know cor as cor corrupt as you can possibly imagine i mean look at all the look at the solar temple for crying out loud i mean there's some so many awful examples of groups that became you know ca catastrophic you what know? was the one um i listened to a podcast uh, from your former employ employers, Tom, sorry. Um, I think it was Steve Crossman. Yeah. That he did, he did, and it was End of Days. Who, what was that one? Da David, was that Koresh. David Koresh. Yeah, Waco. It was Chris uh, oh, bollocks, hang on. I think it was... <laughs> what did Steve Crossman do? He did the Hurricane Tapes. Oh, fuck, they were good. But not that, That's nothing to do with the cult, no. but that was fucking cool. And I told you, it ended up like... All going really quiet, and um, DJ Khaled is involved in it. Oh, really? Yeah, it's well weird. Anyway, um, <laughs> what was it? Yeah, I think it was the one that Chris Warburton did, End of Days. Yeah, about David Koresh. Yeah, that was completely mental. The standoff with the ATF agents. Oh, it's awful. It was that. Do you know what? It's that. Have you watched any documentaries on it? It's an absolute tragedy what happened there. It was a real tragedy. Like even when you look at the statistically, they were like, okay, they were holding up all these guns, which is never a good idea. But per person, they had less guns than your average Texan in that compound, and there were children in there. And at what point did they think that it was okay to start blaring out music as if they were, you know, like in some, you know, doing war torture, which of course is not okay they did, anyway. They started doing that through the night. They, they started they? doing that through the night, and then if you watch, and again, you know, there's lots of theories around it. But you watch documentaries on that and you see the tanks actually blowing like f putting fire into the compound where there were children there were children in there i mean like what was going on and weirdly for us like i was in a cult when that happened i was still a kid in a cult but they used this waco to scare us when we were kids about what could happen because the system was so evil so they allowed us well we weren't allowed to watch things like tv they allowed us to watch that group being burnt to the ground Lexi, just for people who aren't aware of what happened there, just give us a little bit of background on, on what the cult was, who was running it. It was David Koresh that was running it. And, um, you know, I don't know a hell of a lot about their their beliefs, but I know that they had a compound, they had children on it, and he, you know, was a messianic leader. He believed that he was, you know, a, a real prophet. And they ended up having a siege between the, um, with the law enforcement, which they ended up bringing not only police, but tanks in because there was like a huge... Um, uprising at the time, I think it was in the, in the 90s, so it was like 93, 94, something like that, where the media's perspective on cults was like they are absolutely deviant, deviant and they need to be expunged from the planet and it was 
was a huge obviously a lot of them were bad but the the way that everyone reacted was extremely terrified and they essentially had a siege that lasted like was it for a week something crazy like that and in the end they got stormed by the tanks and obviously what the government will tell you and I sound like a conspiracy <laughs> theorist don't I oh my god I had you've a real joined, you've joined that other I cult. had a real moment just then what the government will tell yeah. you guys on a podcast with you guys um but no, they, what they'll tell you is that, you know, that they that the compound burnt to the ground and the shots were fired, were fired by them first, etc. Whatever happened, it was unnecessary and children died in it. And there was like two pregnant ladies in there as well. And essentially it kind of burnt to the ground. I don't even know, if was there any survivors? There were a few people that got out before the kind of actual season. There were survivors. There were a couple of survivors. I think there was 15 survivors that are still around. I think it was 76, including children, died. Yeah. And there was a couple of ATF agents, yeah. four or five ATF agents that died from it. Um, what about the Jim Jones? Didn't that end with he poisoned mass suicide? That's, yeah. that's where we get the, cool, the, the Kool Aid from, right? How, that's yeah. where the term the Kool, -Aid. the Kool Aid comes from. How do you, you convince someone? I can sort of get my head around convincing someone to join the cult and stay in the cult, but how do you then convince someone to take their own life? As as the solution, that's what we're meant to do. Because imagine if, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Bex. Hadn't they had some practice runs with that mm. one, Bexy, where yeah. they had, they basically practiced the mass suicide and they gave them the same drink without any poison in. So it became, the ritual was yeah. there already. Yeah, yeah. It And I think in answer to your question of how do you convince somebody that, if you convince somebody that when they leave this world that there is an incredible, magical, heavenly place that they're going to where they're going to live in a palace and that you are going to be with your Lord and Saviour. It's in the same, you know, again, very clumsy um, kind of connections, but in the same way that, you know, how could you convince somebody to be a suicide bomber? You know, you're telling them that at the end of this, they have like the virgins and all the rest of it. And there's this other world that they get to go to. I think there's a lot of people who get a real peace out of the idea that the end of the world is coming. You know, there's a lot of people that even now are in these Armageddonist groups where they think like, oh, if all of this is over, how incredible that will be. That will be. They're praying for it. They're praying for that final day. I was listening to a podcast the other day that was um, talking about a cult uh, that kind of exists mainly on the Internet where they all kind of believe that the end of the world is coming. And I, there's all they're all talking about it as if it's like this magical moment. They're like, and oh, we're just praying that today is the day that everything ends. And it's almost like this. It's, you know, what you could call a death wish. But they're 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 hoping for it. They're willing it on. They're waiting for it. It's not just something it's not something they're scared of. Like, as kids, we were terrified of it. But for the adults, it's like, oh, my God. And I think that if you tell people that they've got this incredible, magical place they're going to where they're, they're the overlords and you convince them of that, then it's not too far of a stretch to get them to drink the Kool-Aid, is it? Because, you know, we'll have a sip of this and then everything's amazing. I still think it's too far a stretch. Well, mainly as in, no, you're right, the way you've described it all. But there's no way in a million years that I would be like, yeah, I'm going to drink that because that's just from my personal perspective. No, I'd rather stay here. Yeah, the world is yeah. a bit shit at times, but there's actually really loads of good and fun in the world that I'd rather stick around for. Um, plus, I don't think, I think Kool-Aid tastes like shit. Mm -hmm. anyway. It's not nice, is it? If it's like gonna, Gatorade. Ugh, yeah. no, no thanks. If you're going to, surely you'd, can nice I beer a better, or something? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, your oh, God, craft like, beer. Yeah, it's in... like your last one. I remember nice, you know, dry cider. With cyanide. But then, <laughs> with a, cy a cyanide cider. Cyanide. Cyanide. Nearly, we bought Montour. We nearly got there. Cyanide. 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 There we go. Hey, we're going out on the cyanide tonight. But do you remember, I, you know, the O shows that I was just talking yeah. about with the wild, wild country? Do you know what they did with the, with all the homeless people? They were trying to swing the vote in the town that they lived in so that the O shows could become like the mayor of the <sighs> entire town. So they were politically motivated. So this, I think, is kind of genius and you should probably never say that about like a destructive cult but they went into a local town they picked up something like 500 homeless people they got them all shit-faced 
So they gave them the cyanide in a way, but it wasn't cyanide. that poison in it. I think it had something like, and I, you look it up, but it was something like MDMA or something else what? like that in it. They got them really loose and they took all these homeless people to the voting stations and got them to vote for the Oshos to be the political leaders of the town. And it's like, I can, you know, as a homeless person, like I can imagine like if someone's saying to you, hey, get on this bus, we're going to get you like laced. Um, you'd be like, sure, why not? I don't mind casting my vote for that. And um, I think it, I think it worked. So while you might not be interested in the Kool Aid, if someone said to you, "Here's a, here's, a, you know, a, a cider, yeah, a side, no, here's a keg of beer laced with something exciting that's going to make you feel a bit fruity and vote for us," you you <laughs> might be, you might be, you know, I'm there. When was the last time you felt fruity, Joe? Um, it looks pretty fruity now. Fr fruity. Uh, when was the last time I took uh, mushrooms? Uh, <laughs> hmm. Tuesday. Can't, can't quite... <laughs> I've been micro dosing. Uh, micro dosing. <laughs> I've been micro dosing. Uh, I haven't. That's complete bollocks. Or have I? You know, I don't know what to think anymore. This whole fucking episode, double episode. I'm like, oh my god, my brain is fried, but in a good way. That I'm just gonna leave here and. Join uh, Scientology in <laughs> East Grinstead. It's, it's local. Off on the way home. It's, it's local. local. That's, that's, a that's, that's the nice it's thing, convenient. isn't it? Yeah. It's convenient. Yeah, it's like the co-op on your doorstep, isn't it? It's, it's easy, just popping out. <laughs> it's a Tesco just, Metro. Yeah. <laughs> just popping out, going to get some thetons or whatever attached to you. <laughs> oh, I love it. What about Charles Manson, Bexy? So we've got a podcast series called Death of a Film Star. And we did an episode about Sharon Tate. Oh, my God, what a tragedy. An awful tragedy. So I, as part of writing that script, had to do a lot of research into Charles Manson. And clearly you feel no sympathy for a man like Charles Manson, whose followers at his bequest committed horrendous, heinous, heinous brutal. brutal crimes and murders. But there was something about Charles Manson's early childhood where he was abused in care mm. and... You don't feel like saying he never had a chance because everyone has a choice. Yeah. But his childhood was so horrific, you got the sense that maybe a certain path was set for him. Yeah. I mean, there's in, that's interesting when you look at kind of how people end up being either psychopaths, sociopaths. I know that the, there's a difference between them is one's genetic and the other one is from your kind of uh, your your surroundings, isn't it? So you can imagine that potentially, and again, I don't remember much from my time at medical school, but I'll give it a whirl anyway. Um, I never went. <laughs> uh, I can imagine that for somebody like him who goes through really traumatic experiences and abuse, etc., you can imagine that they have this specific path. And when you look at the psychology of children and it's like what makes somebody turn into someone like him and what makes somebody not... The, one of the biggest kind of schools of thought is around this idea of a benevolent witness. The benevolent witness is the person that in these situations where you are being abused, where you're being treated with nothing but contempt, where you are told that you are less than worthless, the benevolent witness can be someone like an auntie, an uncle or grandma, maybe a brother or sister who is there, who's got you, who sees you and says what's happening to you is fucked up. And potentially someone like Charles Manson, I don't know enough about his history, maybe he didn't have that. So, you know, because why I always ask the question, how come some kids go through this horrendous abuse and turn out to be wonderful parents? Yeah, for example. I, 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 that... you know, and, and it's that there can be a small thing that makes the shift because you need to know that outside of what's happening to you, that you are worth something and that you still have purpose and love. And it can just be one person that gives you that the neighbor of a child that's being abused can be that person, which is why our interactions are so incredibly important, can be so powerful. I don't know if you guys know about the. My story with Walter, um, who was the first person that asked me a question that completely changed my life as like an 11 year old. So I'd just come out of my year of silence and all the rest of it. And he was the first journalist that was allowed into the children of God. And he said to me at, at 11 in my interview with him, he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd never been asked that question before in my life. And I'd never had an adult speak to me the way that he was speaking to me, which was this, there was no mal intent. And I could feel that because kids know what is and what isn't right. We know when a hug's for us or a hug's for you. Mm. Like we get it. And he said that to me and I was looking for the lie in his face being like, is he joking around? Because I knew that I was going to die at the age of 14 and I didn't have an adulthood to look forward to. But when he said that, that was a real crack in the wall that was a kind of escape route out because I was like hang on he's just said to me what I want to be when I grow up and maybe I can grow up maybe there is a life outside of this so to bring it back to um Charles Manson it's like maybe when he grew up in all this sense of abuse and stuff he didn't have 
somebody who witnessed it or told him he was okay. And that is horrific to think that, you know, these horrible actions come out of a horrible childhood. But also there are many instances of kids who've gone through what he's he went through and who turn into, like, I am amazed by the kids that I grew up with who went through some of the, these unspeakable things and I look at them at parent, as parents now and they essentially go, whatever our parents did, we're doing the opposite and they are wicked parents and it's incredible and I've seen wonderful families come out of that group. So, you know, there is hope and there is light and there can be the opposite. But yeah, you're right, you know, a lot of times you can trace these cult leaders back to, you know, a, a, abuse of their own kind and, you know, which is horrible to think of how the cycle of abuse works. I just worry about finding excuses for people that have put themselves in those positions. I get it. I do get it from how you've described well the people that have been abused and grow up to be incredible people. There's people that have been abused that grow up to be serial killers. Yeah. There is always a choice. And I know it's easy to sit here and go, well, hang on a minute, you haven't gone through it to then make that choice and know how hard it is. But yeah. I sit on the side of, I think Charles Manson was a bad egg. Yeah, he definitely was. And there's that. Do you ever, do you ever think to yourself that there are people that are just evil? Do yeah. you think that everything comes from something? Or do you think that there are people that are just born? And like, you know, that whole kind of the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath, as I was just saying, like this, I think the psychopath is the genetic thing, you know, the lack of empathy. But there are psychopaths out there who have been diagnosed that have lack of empathy, but still don't act on doing awful things. So I think it's a combination of like, and again, I'm completely talking above my pay grade here. I have zero expertise. <laughs> no, we in we we that had I'm a uh, <laughs> psychologist. Was he a psychologist or psychiatrist? Psychologist. He's an expert. We had a guest, Bexy, who was an expert in psychopaths and oh, spent his it. whole wow. career working awesome. with psychopaths. And he was talking about how manipulative they can be, and how even though he had the knowledge of how manipulative psychopaths could be at a couple of points he suddenly realized that he was being manipulated <gasps> by the psychopaths that he was Ooh, working with goosebumps. the amount of times he said oh yeah we'd just have like a jam session let's get rid of tiles out have a little jam and i'm like you're sitting there with a psychopath who's like the, and you're just jamming with him mm. he was like yeah i know i mean it was a pretty good jam session to be honest i was like <laughs> Oh, I think goodness. you need to snap. He said, luckily, I did snap out of it and then realise things. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It, it, there are, I think there are people in the world that are just shit and they're born <laughs> shit and <laughs> genetically. And That's stuff. the medical term. Sorry. <laughs> and then there are people that are, are shit because of a combination of things and, and stuff like that. But This is a ludicrous example, Joe. But you know the whole stuff around Saracens rugby? Where which, they which part? <laughs> so, Bexy, this is a club who identified or self identified as the Wolf Pack. That was their branding for themselves, wasn't mm -hmm. it? As players, their mentality. Mm -hmm. And they were a very tight unit, Joe, weren't they? They had um, a chairman who, how can we put this? It was a unique financial deal going He, he invested heavily in, in building this squad. Um, with a lot of his own money, actually, to be fair. And in fact, there was a bit of a consortium, is the word that a lot of South African, they built this squad. And it was amazing that people would sign there and the the press releases that would come out, every single press release was, I've joined here because there's something special happening at Saracens. And it was word, there's something, someone else was like, there's something special happening here. And it was almost got to the point, it was like, what? Creepy. This is there's something special happening at Saras. It's like fucking. It, they've they've either decided to try and brainwash people to, and everyone else outside the club as well to be like, oh, oh my god, there's something special happening at Saras. I want to go to Saras. Pass it. On. Or they're they're really lazy <laughs> in their in their media department where they've just copy and pasted the the release for thingy. But yeah, they're a really tight knit group, and they went on to win multiple trophies. In rugby, dominated the sport for the last what eight years? I yeah. So there was something special going on. There was something special. I mean, <laughs> special you could was. argue they, they there was a few rules broken. I mean, they were relegated for breaking salary cap regulations and um, fined five point seven million pounds <laughs> for doing so. So there was some irregularities. Was that a unique financial uh, <laughs> yeah. setup you were talking about. But the, it, 
they were, I wouldn't say they were a cult, but it was cult-like in the sense they were so strong as a unit. They'd all grown up together. A lot of the core of that squad had come through the academy together from 16, 15, 16, 17. And they were really tight. And I don't, I find it a little bit uncomfortable talking about Saracens full stop, but <laughs> in a cult way. Well, you've got mates. There's you've a lot of really similarities come through that, so. Yeah, between the tightness and uh, fuck everyone else, else outside mm. of the wolf pack. And we're going to do it our way in the language. And they had these big signs and banners above their stadium. Humility, teamwork, discipline. And it was like constant. I was like, fucking hell, they're brainwashing all of them. Mm. At one point, I was like, I'd quite like to join Sarah's. <laughs> so I can see how it works. But Take a sip of that something special that's happening there. The cyanide. <laughs> they were offering cyanide. I was like, okay, that's not for me. I'll just stay here. Thanks. <laughs> that's Brilliant. It. Um, but I don't think, yeah, it's hard to actually relate them to, to a cult-like. Do you think, Joe, you would ever be vulnerable to a cult? Because we we talk to a lot of fascinating people on your podcast, and some a lot of it changes the way we look at the world, or it forces us to re-examine how we feel about the world. And you've got your you've got quite an open nature, haven't you? And you are trying to find answers, like all of us, to certain questions. Do you think you would ever be vulnerable to the sort of cult that Bexy's told us about, where it doesn't seem to be a cult; it's just nice people helping you out with answers to questions? Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, I am that gullible and easily manipulated. And yet I think that I'm not. That's which is when it's scary, exactly. isn't it? It's like when you, you work in advertising, yeah. you think it doesn't affect you. It's like, you show me one advert and I'm immediately buying whatever it is. I'm so susceptible to stuff like that. The more that you think your barriers are up, the less they are. So bonkers. Um, I don't know about you, mate, but this has been... One of my favourites. <laughs> Absolutely. It's blown my mind. I didn't think, I thought coming in like, I'll oh, get into some cults, let's hear your story and all that, that and fucking <laughs> just splattered all over the fucking studio. Um, and I've loved listening to you, the way you speak, the strength that you've shown. Um, thank you. I think you're wonderful. <laughs> I think you're you brilliant. So, so thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to me and Tom. Um, it's been an honour. Your book's out. It's out now, is Yeah, it's it? out now. And it's called Cult Following. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.